So our next presenter is Rim Tool from the National Library in France. Uh, she's in charge of digital collections at the uh, Performing Arts Department. And so you will present uh, the work you have done also with a lot of uh, storage capacity and so on for the uh, Amos Gitai uh, collection. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Clarisse and uh, Jacob, for the invitation. So uh, I'll start by saying that uh, maybe I'm a bit of an outsider uh, here at, at this conference compared to the, to the other speakers because I'm neither an academic or a researcher uh, in digital humanities, nor am I here um, to uh, present you um, an annotation or image exploration tool, but rather to give you uh, librarians and archivists' uh, point of view on the many challenges raised by digital archives in terms of collection management and uh, digital preservation and give you some feedback on the processing of porn digital archives at the BNF uh, project the library has been involved in for over 10 years now. So I'm going to use the example of the performing arts collections because this department uh, is a bit of a pioneer in terms of processing this kind of collection at the BNF, but also because the diversity and complexity of these archives, which have been uh, which have already been well demonstrated by previous speakers, have been used to initiate a reflection on the workflows and tools to, de to develop for um, the processing of uh, these kind of archives. So I'll use a specific example, the digital collection of film and theater director Amos Gitai, uh, who donated his uh, archive in um, 2018, 2018 to the Performing Arts Department. And uh, which provides a good overview of the issues raised uh, by creative digital archives, both theatrical and audiovisual. So, um, before getting to the heart of the matter, uh, a few words about the BNF and the Performing Arts Department. Um, so, the BNF, uh, as some of you already know, is a public institution under the supervision of the Ministry of Culture and has the mission of, I quote, uh, collecting, preserving, enriching, and giving access to the national documentary heritage, uh, as stipulated in its founding de decree. And the BNF expands uh, its collections through various channels, the main one being legal deposits, uh, and uh, the second one being acquisitions of uh, documents published abroad or prestigious uh, heritage documentations and uh, or donations. So in the field of performing arts, um, it covers a wide range of disciplines, theater, dance, mime, circus, puppetry, etc. And uh, these uh, collections come from a variety of producers, stage directors, uh, playwrights, actors, set decorators, costume designers, etc. and document all stages of uh, creation. For almost 30 years, but especially over the last decade, uh, these acquisi acquisitions and donations have taken on a digital form, and this trend has increased significantly uh, in the performing arts uh, field. As you all know, uh, creators, companies, and theaters have uh, largely achieved um, digital transformation in their daily, daily practice. And this means for uh, libraries and uh, cultural heritage uh, institutions in general, uh, that now we have uh, collections representing uh, hundreds of terabytes of a uh, lot of different kinds of um, collections, photographs, live recordings, uh, communication documents, etc. And uh, we are really reaching, or we are already <laughs> in a transi transitional period where uh, digital transformation is almost complete and we are not uh, yet receiving uh, 3D models, CAD drawings, etc. but we are uh, getting ready for it. Uh, so this paradigm shift uh, is a well-established challenge for heritage institutions today as the issues of um, access and long-term preservation of these documents um, are paramount to their missions. And uh, main today, all heritage institutions are mainly concerned with the question of how to give access uh, and, above all, preserve uh, these volatile and complex archives. Uh, what does uh, preserve mean uh, in uh, this situation, in this case? Above all, it means ensuring the integrity of the original data uh, I guarantee that the data for which we were given responsibility at the time of donation has not been altered. Um, 
and uh, uh, as well as providing direct access to the original document or in cases where the original format cannot be managed and requires to perform a migration to an alternative version as close as possible to the original. That means um, in a format that preserves the uh, significant properties of uh, the original document. In that case, the migrated format uh, is stored together uh, with uh, the original format. Um, while it is uh, in pretty impossible <laughs> to anticipate all the future uses uh, that researcher will make of these archives and to offer tools that fit these potential uses, all the data analysis and uh, processing that we carry out answer um, these two goals. A, identify the risk of digital obsolescence and avoid uh, what we now uh, all know uh, as the digital cliff, uh, which is a uh, massive data loss by creating an alternative but manageable version to which we can guarantee access over time, while of course remaining transparent about the transformation performed on the file, uh, i.e. documenting the operations and context of creation and making this information available to the user, uh, specifying which metadata have been editing, for example, and B, facilitate access to archives by making digital and structured data comprehensible and intelligible more quickly. Uh, it is therefore not our vocation <laughs> at a first level to produce tools for exploring or annotating digital collections, even though, of course, we uh, have put in place of we we offer some of these features in the tools we have um, developed, or rather it is not our vocation uh, to create tools to interpret the documentary collection of the data or produce new data out of this content, mm -hmm. but uh, rather to focus uh, first and foremost on uh, creating analysis tool for sorting and ranging archives. Um, it is with uh, this principle in mind uh, that we started developing a workflow dedicated to the sorting and long-term preservation of these archives, uh, which we call, <laughs> the, its name is, uh, the, the its, um, its uh, nickname is the ADDN workflow, uh, inaugurated in uh, 2017. So ADDN stands for Acquisition et Don de Documents Numériques Natifs, which is Acquisition and Donation of Born Digital uh, Documents. Uh, initially, its uh, aim uh, was to offer a solution for processing certain formats of these archives um, in order to make them available on uh, BNF's digital uh, library called Gallica that some of you know, um, notably uh, JPEG and uh, TIFF image files in the first um, uh, version of uh, the workflow and uh, as well as PDF uh, text files. Uh, as a significant work has since uh, been um, made on a, on a list of guidelines regarding the formats preferred uh, for bit level preservation by the BNF, uh, now this uh, workflow uh, has been opening progressively to new formats, uh, essentially video and sound files, and uh, I'll talk about it uh, later. So uh, ADDN relies uh, partly on the process known as uh, CEDN, that you see here, which is um, the anagram for a digital data chain in French, which corresponds to the series of uh, software programs um, such as validation and characterization tools to ensure the conformity of the uh, documents uh, to the BNS format policy, cataloging applications, etc., through which uh, documents must pass in order to be organized in sets, in units uh, that will be described in the BNF's catalog, so catalog general, um, and uh, made available on Gallica, the BNF digital library on the one hand, and preserved in uh, the BNF's digital storage system called SPAR, uh, that I could talk about for an hour, but I, I won't hear. And um, the first collection going through this uh, data chain was um, uh, uh, processed uh, was uh, the one of a photographer specializing in uh, street performance uh, called uh, Joël Verustraten, uh, which was one the photographer of this uh, photograph. Um, as you can imagine, the speed with which these archives have multiplied and become more and more complex has necessitated um, several evolutions uh, and developments of these workflows. Uh, especially since uh, it used applications initially designed 
for analog or digitized documents only and therefore had to adapt a bit forcibly to uh, born digital uses. Uh, in fact, it very quickly became uh, obvious that we would need a specific tool to prepare uh, these sets, these corpora, and ensure that they were consistent in terms of both formats and metadata before being uh, ingested in SPAR, the, the digital storage system, and shown on uh, Gallica. This was achieved with the creation of a first tool um, called uh, Frontin, uh, which uh, is uh, a tool created uh, in 2016 by my colleague Thomas Ledoux, and uh, that is used to analyze documents before they are uh, ingested by SPAR and um, Gallica. So, uh, to create, I, I won't get too <laughs> far into the, the description of this tool because I want to show you another one, but um, to prepackage these documents, uh, Frontin performs automatic file uh, checks using validation and uh, characterization tool, Apashtika and Jove, for those who know them, and thus uh, provides access to characterization elements uh, which helps us that you can see uh, here on the, the right side of the uh, screen uh, to help us check the compliance and non-compliance of these documents to the Adidian format policy and um, helps us to estimate whether uh, transformation is necessary before uploading to uh, the digital data chain. And um, it helps us cre create what we call boxes at the time um, that uh, allows us to add metadata uh, on it. Uh, so you see here how you can create uh, boxes and add comments uh, uh, mainly about the transformation that you could um, uh, perform on these documents and uh, that these comments uh, can be um, destined to uh, the producer of this transformation or to the user. Uh, so uh, as you can see here, we, uh, for the compliance, I didn't, I didn't uh, explain it, but to, to know if the format is managed uh, by the IDDN um, workflow, you have this little smiley <laughs> uh, um, uh, system with the green one, meaning that the format is valid and you can use it, or uh, if it's not, and if it needs a transformation, then you have this little <laughs> red um, uh, smiley face. Uh, it, um, so here is uh, uh, the pre, um, how can I say, the automated, <laughs> the auto-completed form uh, that you can uh, use to um, add comments in, in it, uh, documenting the transformation. So you can see here, uh, for instance, you can have a, a file uh, that was uh, transferred in TIFF formats has been converted to uh, the JPEG format, etc. And that will be an information available to the user on the catalogs and on Gallica uh, afterwards. Uh, you can also document the transformation. Um, uh, you can also, sorry, ask for a transformation directly uh, from uh, this app. Um, and so we have a catalog <laughs> of uh, migration. Um, services that can be used. And uh, very quickly, you can add a few information uh, on uh, the set, on the packages, as we call them, and add uh, uh, a, few, a few information, pieces of information, such as uh, the name of the collection, uh, legal um, information, etc. And you ha also have access to uh, the um, final uh, classification structure that uh, this tool uh, uh, can um, uh, allow to make when sorting the, the collection. So um, this uh, tool was, while fulfilling its function very well, um, doesn't allow to provide, doesn't provide a general idea of the content of the collection and therefore cannot really be used to sort unstructured data because uh, the contents of the sets of the packages uh, have to be constituted beforehand, have to be formed beforehand. And um, this application also wasn't uh, fully uh, uh, supported by the IT department. There couldn't be 
um, monitored and maintained over time. And with the ar arrival of um, a particularly complex digital archive, the need for tools specifically, specifically sorry, designed to take into account the specificities of this type of collection uh, became even more ap apparent. A uh, turning point was indeed in the donation of the collection of uh, director Amos Gitai, who in 2018 <coughs> donated to the Performing Arts Department uh, the full archives around his film, uh, Rabin the Last Day, that was released in 2015, and uh, that contained um, uh, a lot of um, data, uh, specifically 19 terabytes of data, over 150,000 files, um, covering uh, over 200 files, uh, uh, sorry, how many already? Um, 200 file extensions, yes, and uh, contained all the research material um, and film material uh, used for the film. Uh, so the scope uh, of this collection was, uh, was going from the documentation uh, used to write the film uh, to the Final Cut Pro libraries used to edit the film, uh, of course, uh, with uh, all the rushes, uh, scouting photographs, scouting photos, editing files, etc. Uh, it was also um, uh, uh, completed by uh, a few other um, documents uh, of um, Amos Gitai, uh, films, uh, uh, documentation for exhibitions and plays he has given around uh, the same subject of the movie. So if, if you don't know the movie, it is a film uh, that takes on a very particular form because it's a hybrid uh, film combining a real archive, um, uh, television archive mostly, and reenacted scenes that um, is inspired by all the research made on this film. And uh, uh, the, the film is about the last day of Yitzhak Rabin, um, Israeli, um, the Israeli prime minister who was an assassinated in November um, 1995. And the film um, elaborates on uh, this event and all the events leading um, to, to it. Um, so, um, as I said, it was very unusual uh, data, mainly also because um, it was uh, mostly unstructured data set, uh, since a large um, uh, portion of these archives uh, were copied from various computers, um, uh, respectively the script writers, producers, and editors, which explains the very ramified nature of the, this collection, made up of several sets of documents, often um, sorry, can you speak a bit too fast? Um, often difficult to identify, such as uh, direct camera output, uh, unnamed files or files named in Hebrew, uh, videos downloaded from YouTube, television archives, and so on. So, a very diverse um, range of sources that are not easy to trace and. Uh, un not easy to identify, and but that were also very representative of the film's nature as a hybrid of, uh, as I said, archival footage and reenacted scenes. Uh, it's also very representative of Amos Gitai's uh, creation, creations process because uh, he it exposes all the um, the relations between Amos Gitai's different works and uh, it adds to the challenge <laughs> because dealing with uh, this kind of collection uh, means also trying to explicitly show uh, the network of uh, these uh, works and, and their ramification. Um, it was a colossal work uh, to get to this unstructured data to this classification structure, um, mainly so the, the work of a, a specific work group dedicated to this task and uh, an intern that worked for months uh, on this. We also had to uh, resort to work directly with uh, the donors, uh, mostly the scriptwriter Marie-José Sanselme and uh, Rifka Gitai, uh, who um, made the, a lot of research for, for the film. And um, we managed to get um, this, uh, this, cl this uh, classification. Um, I don't have the time to, uh, 
tell you all that I plan to, but um, while the sorting for the arranging for this collection was mm, largely manual, it was also um, the, um, the opportunity to uh, test or get information over several existing exploration tools that I won't have the time to, um, to develop. Uh, but um, that's, uh, so you have these four or five applications, La Suite Archifiltre, Octave, EPAD, and Recall, so two uh, government-supported uh, tools and then uh, three others developed and supported by uh, universities. And that um, allowed us to check on what was already available in terms of expo exploring tool, exploration tools for uh, archive, um, archive collections. Um, so uh, we actually tested this um, tools, try to uh, benchmark functionalities that we could implement in uh, homemade applications, <laughs> because at the BNF we don't uh, we don't uh, use open source tools, but we create uh, our own applications for uh, security reasons, and uh, that's why we created. Uh, so yes, I. I wanted to tell more about the, the functionalities, but you see a few screenshots of this, um, this application. So uh, Archifiltre, uh, which uh, allows to have a da data vis visualization option, uh, Octave, uh, Recall. Um, and then we created our own applications called uh, Trinum. Uh, which uh, the development started in um, 2019 and uh, that has involved um, various agents in the library, so collection managers, um, uh, to uh, identify the uses and needs relating to uh, the processing of these archives, developers, of course, to implement these uses, digital preservation experts and um, uh, formats experts as well. So Trinium, as I said, was designed as a, as a web service um, and, um, and is usable and can be used on any BNF uh, workstation, but won't be, uh, uh, is not available uh, elsewhere. That's why I will only show you <laughs> a few screenshots and not demo it. Um, so what is the purpose of Trinium? Uh, Trinium uh, first helps us to uh, define a new file arrangement, as I showed you, to be able to autom automate in a way what we have done with the Amos Gitai collection, visually check the content and technical characteristic of the file to make sure they fit the format policy, um, to sort directly the, the, the files, uh, which can be accept them, um, migra migrate, transform them, delete or, or uh, refuse them, and then define a description level, uh, and for that, adding or editing descriptive um, metadata. So this is what uh, Trinium uh, lo looks like. Uh, as I said, the, the um, development of this application, um, no, I didn't say it, but it's, it's done um, uh, through an ag agile method, so it's, uh, it has to be implemented uh, through the use of it, and um, so it's a, it's very much a work in progress. Uh, so it doesn't yet fulfill all the the functions we have planned for it, but uh, most of all, it it allows you to retrieve downloaded data uh, that we have transferred through through another service that I won't talk about here. Get an overview of um, the uh, original structure. So. Um, this is, for instance, uh, one of the, the screens where you can, one of the, the possible views that you can, can have of the, the original classification structure. You find the, the same uh, color display uh, to know uh, if uh, the, the files um, are conformed to the format policy. Uh, you also have ex you can also have access directly on metadata on uh, the the collection uh, such as uh, the name you will have entered uh, prior, but uh, how how it was retrieved, how many files there is, uh, the the number of folders, etc. 
you can also uh, access um, sorry access uh, metadata uh, for each file, uh, file characterization metadata using um, media info, a tool based on the map type analysis, and uh, then decide what you can do with the file. Um, so, uh, for instance, um, sorting it, as you can see here, what we call a packet, as I said earlier, package, uh, ajouto paquet, to uh, refuse the um, the data uh, to sort it or to exclude it from the uh, from the, the package, and then uh, you can also um, uh, uh, ask for uh, an expertise, a format expertise on the um, data. You see the uh, expertise label. Um, so you you also have access to uh, a notation. Uh, through um, uh, this uh, uh, functionality, not the travail, uh, where it is possible to give details or clarify the content of metadata. Uh, so this information can be added to uh, the package or be used later in the describing of the, the documents on the catalogs. So uh, this is the stage where you can say it's a duplicate or for instance, uh, you can say if it's a of a draft or part of uh, uh, the uh, original script, documentation, etc. Um, and then uh, create packages, as I said. This will be uh, then directly uh, exported to uh, the digital um, uh, storage system, uh, SPAR. So these are a few. And very quickly, uh, we are working on the second version, where this time you can uh, trace directly the transformation operated on the files and uh, being able to um, converse directly with formats expert, uh, as I said, to ask uh, for a format expertise. And uh, it also allows the uh, format experts to have access directly to the files and the metadata to process the, the transformation. So uh, very quickly, this is the format policy we have uh, just achieved, achieved in this uh, form. Uh, so this is the, the guidelines regarding uh, what we can, um, uh, what the, the formats that we prefer as uh, an institution uh, for, for uh, bit level preservation. Uh, this will be translated into English and shown on the BNF site uh, very quickly. Um, as you can see, uh, this uh, annotation and sorting uh, application was mainly uh, created to um, meet the preservation purposes I uh, talked at the begin. Uh, I told you about at the beginning of this presentation, and to keep track of to keep track of the transformation performed on the file. But uh, of course, it has still some limitation. It cannot suit. Um, it cannot offer mass processing options, and it is not suitable for complex content, uh, such as uh, the formats uh, necess necessitating um, software emulation. And I wanted to finish with an example that was. Uh, uh, in the, the Amos Gitai uh, collection, which was, as I said, the uh, editing library, so using uh, the um, software called Final Cut Pro in its uh, version X10, um, which is uh, basically, uh, that works like every uh, file uh, editing uh, software, but uh, that uh, uh, creates very complex, um, uh, digital objects to preserve because, of course, the the main goal here is to preserve the experience uh, of the documents inside the um, library and to be able to uh, navigate on uh, this timeline uh, because, as you, you may know, uh, a lot of different uh, documents are um, uh, aggregating on this timeline, and the idea is to be able to browse in it. But so far, we have only been able to process each document um, uh, uh, separately, se 
separately. Uh, so the main question now is how to display this library, how to keep their significant properties, and is um, software emulation enough? This is one of the uh, prospects that we have been working on um, these past uh, few years. Um, what comes next, uh, just to, to conclude, uh, I'd like to say that um, uh, as you might have um, conclude from my presentation. Uh, we, as uh, librarians, are uh, heritage um, professionals, uh, work on preserving the data and the, um, the exploration of the data per se um, is, um, the, the data is here for exploration by researchers and we are very keen on uh, having new projects uh, using uh, uh, computational methods, AI, also um, uh, with our collection. And this is uh, done also by a service uh, called the Data Lab at the BNF that you can explore on the, the website. And a few um, digital projects have already uh, been um, achieved there. There's one with Clarisse also uh, in uh, the making. And um, we, as I said, I mentioned AI, we are, uh, of course, uh, diving into these uh, new methods. I just wanted to um, tell you about, very quickly, about Gallica Pix, uh, which is um, uh, an application uh, created by um, Jean-Philippe Moreux, who is an expert Gallica at the BNF, and uh, Guillaume Chiron. Uh, which use uh, the deep learning techniques to allow to annotate iconographic corpora uh, that are present on Gallica and uh, enrich their um, metadata with uh, additional information on their visual and textual um, com compositions, uh, which enables to look for uh, terms directly on uh, these corpora and uh, having a annotation to, uh, to adjust uh, let you uh, few, give you a few um, uh, mail addresses, email addresses, if you want to know more about the performing arts or the digital formats at the BNF. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, to me, it was really important to have uh, librarians and uh, well. Pres people in charge of the preservation of cultural heritage uh, in this conference. We had uh, Ian Asha yesterday. And um, so uh, we have the time for a few questions. You're angry. Uh, I have many questions. Uh, <laughs> first, uh, first one uh, would be, uh, so you concluded with the data lab and the researchers, and I was wondering, and uh, if with the uh, Amos Gitai collection, which, which is one quite well, very complex collection, um, how the researchers engage uh, with this collection? Do you have already people uh, looking for this kind of uh, a complex archive, Espec uh, specifically uh, people working with creation process uh, research? Um. Yes, we have researchers uh, interested in the in uh, the genetics of films uh, uh, that are really interested into the the editing libraries, uh, the rushes because I didn't say it, but it covers uh, half of the the collection. Um, the problem is with this kind of documents of this kind of libraries. As um, as I said, there were very various sources. Uh, to this collection, and uh, these uh, libraries were uh, made of different uh, documents coming from various sources, and sometimes the links between these documents and the editing files were broken, so there's a whole work to do on recreating these links, and this is something that uh, asks for uh, uh, knowledge of Final Cut Pro um, editing use, and this is only um, this is something we have considered giving uh, be as a as a research project with researchers working directly on uh, uh, this data. Uh, 
The, the question now is how to give access to these libraries. Uh, of course, it's, uh, uh, we also, uh, one of our missions is also to um, be sure the safety, the security of these uh, uh, files um, remains intact. So we, we still are working <laughs> on uh, this aspect, and, uh, but we know there are a lot of researchers still uh, waiting for, for this. Other questions? Yes, Olivier. Thank you for this presentation. I have a question related to the preservation of software, of software, basically, like you, you mentioned Final Code Pro, for instance, and you had, you, you proposed two options, which were either emulation to be able to fully experience software or a screenshot of the timeline. Do you have any other ideas of possible intermediary preservation mediums for this kind of thing, like you could have the data Final Cut Pro in some open format, so preserving data, but of course, uh, preserving the experience of the software, like full montage. Is it, so you, do you have any ideas of other preservation mediums for surrogates for, for this data? Uh, we haven't considered them yet because we, um, what we will probably do uh, will be to uh, em emulate because it's the easiest one, and um, we we are going because so far the the logic the BNF's logic was to show everything on into uh, Gallica on Gallica this uh, digital library, and we didn't consider uh, outside uh, um, uh, tools uh, external tools. Uh, and the idea was to, um, we will set up a specific uh, computer uh, with uh, this um, uh, software and emulate it and we haven't considered any, because the, the, um, the way this kind of software works uh, is too complex to think of, because we, we already thought of just showing uh, the documents one after another, showing different uh, screenshots, and but we wanted to keep the dynamic of the of the software. And uh, the only way we have found so far is uh, emulation, because this is also something that we know how to do. Even if we don't know how to do it with Final Cut Pro yet, but we will in time. Um, so no, we haven't yet think of another thing. Other questions? Uh, maybe I have a last one, uh, which is about uh, you have many, many more artists who wants to uh, give the archives to the to the BNF, and so uh, they they will give you their hard drives. Or how how do you uh, deal with them when they said, okay, I I, I would like to give you uh, all my production, and now this production is more and more digital, uh, as you have said. So, uh, because uh, Amos Guitar is quite of a very specific study case. So, do you plan to accept more and more uh, documents or collections like the Amos Guitar, or was it an exception <laughs> and uh, it was so complicated that it's over? <laughs> um, we now we learned lessons <laughs> with uh, the Amos Gitai collections. Uh, this is why we created the formats policy I uh, told you about because uh, usually these uh, the formats that are recommended by the BNF uh, are easier to manage, are uh, represent less terabytes in total. Because now what we uh, what we we have a discussion uh, with the donors always with this kind of uh, collection. And we really try to have as structured <laughs> uh, data can, and can be. And um, we also ask for, in certain cases, to perform the migrations before we get the, the data. So it is eas more easily managed uh, inside the BNF after. Uh, we, we don't, we, don't really get unstructured data anymore. 
except in certain cases where, of course, a theater is closing, a company is closing, and there's an emergency, and there's no one to perform the migrations or, or arranging the um, collection beforehand. So <laughs> we then get the whole uh, data, but we try more and more to uh, have a discussion with the donor so he can give us as uh, structured <laughs> a hard drive can be. Um, and uh, we, it's, it's working. <laughs> we had uh, a bit more archive from Amos Gitai, for instance, and we had very structured data this time because we, we asked uh, uh, that we uh, could uh, implement what we had learned <laughs> on the first uh, set. Jacob, last question. Sorry, just maybe to follow up on that. Um, when if an artist gives you their hard drive, um, do you keep a trace also of, of even if it's unstructured and, and very messy, do you keep a trace of the artist's structure that they had on the hard drive? Because that can also be a, a trace of their creative process, mm -hmm. the way that they organize their, their, their documents and objects. We are still uh, considering how to give access to this original uh, structure, but yes, so far we have kept all the uh, original uh, classifications we received uh, because we thought also it was a trace of the creative process. Um, and I didn't say it, but we are uh, we are working on images of the data and not on the data itself. So when the files are on the server, we don't touch directly the files um, stored there. We we work on an image, so all the rearranging, etc., is made on an image of the the original one. But the question is how to give access to that because we don't think the screenshot of just the original structure is really interesting to the researcher. But we will see. Maybe <laughs> maybe we'll have feedback on that later. Well, thank you so much, Win. So now there is a lunch outside, and uh, don't forget that there is uh, this really beautiful uh, exhibition at the library. So you don't, if you don't know how to go to the library, uh, Jacob and I and uh, all the people around can give you the direction.